guys. Thanks so much for joining me today on CWC for my interview with Reza Safina. Before we start the episode, I wanted to give you a bit of an update. While the show's hiatus ended up being a little longer than planned, I think it was for the best. It gave me the chance to have a break from school, record several episodes of the show ahead of time, and settle into my new summer jobs. There's also another secret project I've putting, been putting a lot of composing hours onto that I'm very excited to share with you once I'm able to. This coming month, you'll notice a few new things about chatting with creators. Through my internship with Palandino Media that I've been placed in with IES Abroad, I'm going to be able to integrate more classical and contemporary artists into the show. I'm excited to share this diversity of content with you all, and here is a special hello to all my new listeners who have joined me from the Palandino pages. That's all for now. Let's start the show. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, good. How are you? Good. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. So sorry we couldn't meet last week. I got stomach flu, which was so much fun. Oh, I can imagine. Oh, my gosh. All right. Well, thank you for coming on here. Are you ready to get started? Oh, yeah. Let's do it. Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. So welcome to CWC. I am so excited to have you on the show and talk about your personal journey to becoming a composer, your upcoming album, and your work on a film score. Would you please introduce yourself to our audience who might not be familiar with your work? Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Reza Safinia. I'm a composer and a record producer and slash artist. Awesome. So first thing I got to ask is please tell us a bit about your artistic journey. As I was doing research on you, I was just so curious. How did you make your way from being a student to becoming a record producer and engineer working with people like Destiny's Child to now being a film score and post-classical composer? Um, well, I, I didn't actually have a formal education in music. I, um, I was always just playing in bands uh, from childhood, uh, from my teenage years. And, um, and then I actually studied economics at university. And during that time, I played in a lot of bands and um, you know, at quite a high level. And I guess I, I, I spent a year working in finance after I graduated and I decided it wasn't for me. And I really just kept hearing music in my head like every day sitting at my desk. And so I, I left and I started working in a recording studio. I moved to New York and I started working in a rap studio, mostly rap. And that's where I ended up working with a lot of those people. With Destiny's Child, I actually didn't um, work as an engineer. That, that, that is, uh, I actually ha was, did have something to do with Destiny's Child, but not in that way. Basically, um, I was in a band and we went touring, uh, opening up for Destiny's Child on their, sh so cool. uh, on their shows. Yeah. So that was really an un unbelievable experience. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a fun memory. That's really cool. I find it really interesting that you studied economics because uh, I have several friends that I go to jazz jams and tech kind of stuff with who actually also have degrees in economics. One of my favorite guitar players actually was just telling me last night, I actually have two degrees in economics. I'm like, really? I never would have guessed. Yeah, well, you know, I, I can't speak for them, but I can tell you from my point of view, math and music are very connected. And the sort of, I, I, I find that a lot of people who are good at music are also good at math if they are exposed to it in the right way. And uh, there's a lot of patterns and stuff like that and parallels. And the reason why I studied economics is because if you're good at math, which I, which I was, um, economics is not difficult. You know, it's kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of like a dirty secret for mathematicians. It's like, you know, uh, you know, people think economics is like really complicated. It's like, if you're good at math, it's pretty easy. So, and because I was like so into music and I wanted to dedicate so much of my time doing music, the reason why I chose to study economics was because I knew I could kind of breeze through it without studying too much. 
and I could actually spend more time focused on music. <laughs> so I love that. Everyone has to take their own path, and it seems to have worked for you. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Um, I just realized I didn't fully answer your first question, which is that anyway, after I uh, was a sound engineer, I became a record producer and an artist, and I was in the music business uh, for a while, you know, doing like pop and R&B and hip hop music. And then probably about 10, 11 years ago, I got the bug to start doing movies. And I moved to LA at that point. And I was just doing short films for people. Um, and eventually, uh, you know, a friend of mine, you know, got the green light to make his feature film. And I, and I did the music for it. And then it kind of moved on from there. And I kind of became now in that track and just kept doing it and again i guess eventually at some point there was no real rite of passage but at some point i became a film composer you know branching off of that with how you work now what is your creative process like and i know when i was reading about you there's a lot of things about mindfulness and meditation how is that a part of your creative process um Thank you for asking. It's it's really kind of like the main part of it, you know, because what I try not to think too much when I'm being creative and just feel and just be present and be in the moment and just uh, like let it come through me as much as I can. Um, and in order to do that, like you, you, can't, you can't, it's funny, I just said as much as I can but it's like you can't try. It's not something you can try for. You can't try to be present. You can't try. It's a little bit like Yoda. It's like do or do not. You know, there is no try. It's like, and in order to, in order to get myself in that state of mind where that will just happen by itself, it has nothing to do with music. It has to do with meditation. And so I meditate and I practice yoga, and I do these things for multitudes of reasons. But when it comes to creativity, the reason is to basically get myself into this state of being where I can just channel stuff that comes to me. I mean, that word sounds a little woo-woo. I didn't mean it that way, but I, I just basically, I mean, I, I'm not forcing something to happen. I'm just letting ideas come through me and I'm not thinking too much about them in an analytical way. And I'm more just, you know, presently, communicating those ideas and when, when I write for example or when I start writing a score I don't get bogged down at all in any kind of technical stuff with logic or with um, you know any kind of computer stuff I just literally sit at the piano or pick up a guitar and I just start playing and a stream of consciousness comes out and I record it and out of that recording you know uh, probably about more than 50% of it is crap, but you know, there's little hidden gems in there that are really cool. And then the analytical part comes after I have that stream and I take those good ideas and I put them together and I start fashioning them. And that's when I start, you know, doing more work that's more effort based rather than inspiration based, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. I when I'm doing my own musical writing, I have a lot of those just sit at the keyboard, do some improv, just kind of see where the moment takes me and then listen to that 15 minute recording and see what I can get out of it. Yeah, cool. That's awesome. So in that same kind of vein, something else I saw when I was reading about your musical journey was this idea of creative nirvana. What does that mean to you? And how do you think other artists should try and achieve it? Well, I, I didn't coin that phrase. And technically, it's probably not a good thing if, 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 if I'm going to be facetious, not facetious, if I'm going to be pedantic about it. Because nirvana is actually the end of the cycle of birth and death. Uh, like, you know, from a, from a Sanskrit point of view, what it means is that, you know, like, you know, if you believe in reincarnation, that, you know, you, you come into this life 
you know, you have suffering and then, you know, you die and then you're reborn and then, you know, there's, you have a karma from the previous life and this cycle keeps going until you pay off your karmic debt and then you reach nirvana, which, you know, we think of as some blissful, amazing moment. Well, the bliss part of it is that basically you kind of, you know, become like Obi-Wan Kenobi and join the force and never come back, you know? So the thing is like creative nirvana is not actually technically a good thing because it basically means you won't have any more creativity, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but um, I feel like the spirit of what that phrase is trying to communicate is kind of this feeling of empty, weightless, you know, beautiful, blissful feeling of just letting it all come in and wash over you, right? I, is, I'm guessing that's what you what you what you mean by that? I wasn't I wasn't sure. In the email that um, Andrew from White Bear PR sent to me, uh, creative nirvana was one of the things that was bolded as something that oh you might want to talk about this. And I wasn't sure because what how you described it was how it's been described to me in like my religious studies class. And I was like. I'm not sure which way this is going to go, but I'll ask. <laughs> I was interested to see what your answer would be because I have met with lots of different people who have lots of different religions and ideas of spirituality. So I wanted to see how that would come from your point of view. I know how some people view Nirvana is very different from how other religions decide to define Nirvana. So it's really cool to see how you are acknowledging it um so i i feel like the, the phrase nirvana the word nirvana in our in our western culture has come to mean something different or people understand something different by it and i feel like probably people think it means like ah, like you know some <laughs> eureka moment or something you know which is not what it actually means but it, it, if if we're going to go with that definition then I think what Andrew was trying to get at was really about the concept of the concept of looking at, at music or any art as a spiritual pursuit, really, and um, not just thinking about it as a functional pursuit, you know, because I, I feel like for a lot of people, at least a lot of people working in media, whether it's film scoring or media or video game scoring or whether it's writing pop songs, it's become very goal orientated. You know, like if you want to write a song or you want to write a hit song, you already have a preconceived notion of oh, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, three choruses, outro, fade out, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and the goal is to write a hit song or, or you know, if you want to, have do a film score and someone puts a temp in it and it sounds like Hans Zimmer and you 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 want to have this big epic in a lot of creative endeavors these days when it, especially when it's a, com a commercial one I or a professional one the there is an objective and you're working towards the objective and that is somewhat antithetical to thinking of music as a spiritual pursuit if you think about the history of music and why we why it even exists you know a lot of the roots of music some people say can be traced to tribal banging drums and singing and and forming circles and a lot of it is ritualistic and you know um related to some kind of trying to connect to you know, however one might perceive God or nature or the universe, you know. And for me, I, f I like to preserve as much of that uh, sensation as I can when I'm writing, even when I'm writing commercially, even when I'm writing with an objective or a goal. Um, I try and, you know, set the intention for the goal and then walk away from it and then try and find my path the goal without thinking about the goal and going down more this sort of spiritual angle so that is possibly what andrew might have meant when he said ask about spiritual nirvana <laughs> yeah 
That's really cool. So because we're limited on time, next let's go ahead and talk about your upcoming album, Yang. I got the awesome opportunity to listen to both Yin and Yang uh, prior to their coming out next month. And I really loved how you capture all these different sounds and soundscapes in both. In your own words, what would you say makes Yang different from your Yin album? Well, Yang is the Yang energy and Yin is the Yin energy. That's, that's what I wanted to, I mean, that's what I was trying to represent in the two albums. And Yang energy is um, active, Yin energy is passive. So the vibe of this album is much more up-tempo um, and I've expressed it not only through the tempo, not only through the, the feeling of it, but also in the production. Yang is an electronic album primarily and Yin is primarily an acoustic neoclassical album. Although when you look at the yin yang symbol, you know, there's dots on either side. So in the black paisley, there'll be a white dot. In the white paisley, there'll be a black dot. And those dots represent the balance within the predominance of one energy. So even within the yin, there's a little yang. And within the yang, there's a little yin. And so I, I, I took that idea sort of uh, with the electronic slash neoclassical aspect of it so that with the neoclassical album there is actually a speckle of electronica and in the electronic album there is a speckle of acoustic pianos and other instruments so I definitely got that that was really cool I definitely got that from listening to both of the albums I first made a point to listen to the whole Yin album and then as soon as I heard that first track of Yang, I was like, okay, this is something really different, but had some of the same core to it. And it, I just loved it. Um, what was your process for creating these kinds of tracks? And don't be afraid to get too technical into it because this is a podcast that is made for people who love the technical side. <laughs> okay, you mean with the Yang album? Like what was, how did I go about making mm -hmm. the tracks? Yeah. So like, how did you start? Do you like sketch things out? And then like, how do you finish it up? Like, what does that process look like for you? Well, most of the ideas melodically in Yang are actually from Yin. So mm -hmm. either I started off by sampling some of my tracks in Yin and then building electronic stuff around them with synthesizers, arpeggiators. Um, you know, obviously I have the four on the floor kick drum. Um, so, you know, either I went about it that way or I didn't use the sample, but I you know, took the melodies that I had already written and I just expressed them in different ways through different kinds of instruments. Um, and then, you know, I guess with electronic music, the, the main aspect of arrangement in electronic music is playing with uh, automating filters and the ADSR and, you know, playing with the envelope because those are the things that you know you can you can take one you can take one note it doesn't even have to be like a, a harmonic thing you can take one note and turn it into something very interesting by just tweaking the filters on it for like five minutes you know <laughs> so yeah. that was a big part of the process <laughs> absolutely one of my fellow composers, Gracie, one of her favorite things to do is go in and modify like the smallest things and just see how she can change it electronically. And I think that is so cool. I'm more of an ac acoustic composer, but just this past year, I started learning more about electronics and I find it so interesting how many things you can change with just like turning the knob a little bit to the right. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and it's kind of like a crazy, like, you know, when I was saying there's a there's a connection between math and music, I mean, for sure, when it comes to analog synthesis, if you really want to understand the chain of what's happening to the sound, it's a, you know, it's an understanding of physics, which really kind of is an understanding of math. So it's kind of interesting to me. So this <laughs> is one of my, yeah. 
This is one of my favorite questions to always ask a composer after they've finished a project. What do you think was the biggest thing that you learned from creating this album? I learned a lot, actually. Um, I learned, I learned a lot specifically with the Yang album because it was so production laden. Um, and I, the album goes into different genres of electronica. And part of the reason why it does that is because I listen to different genres of electronica. And part of the reason is because I was actually experimenting and learning different techniques. And I think my next album or the next thing I work on will probably be more focused in a, t a, a narrower bandwidth of electronic music um, because I think I learned through this process what I really enjoy and where, where, where the next road for me to do further exploration is going to be. That's really cool. May I ask what you think that next road is? Yeah. Um, I've really got into uh, melodic techno, um, specifically a kind of um, Berlin-based sound that is um, kind of a little dark sounding, but it's not dark sounding like in a menacing kind of darkness. It's, it's, I, it's just dark sounding in that it's very warm and the sounds in it don't get too big and too brassy, you know? And mm -hmm. it, it kind of, it's hypnotic. It's almost like Sufi type music, you know? It, it'll it'll t take you into this sort of trance thing. It's not like trance music, but it will put you in a trance. And, uh, and the production is just so clean and, and like very accurate and detailed. So I, I, I kind of, I'm interested to go further down that road. That's really awesome. I look forward to hearing it. It mm -hmm. sounds really cool. I love learning about different areas of music. Awesome. And since we only got a few minutes left, I have to touch on your work for Warrior. So in addition to this amazing solo writing you do, you've also been doing this project with Cinemax. How would you say writing for film is different for you as opposed to your uh, more solo works? Um, yeah, I mean, when, when I'm writing for me, it's purely for me. I'm, I'm not thinking like, you know what we were talking about earlier about having mm -hmm. a goal or an objective? This, the Yin and the Yang albums had no objective. I was literally just, you know, it's pandemic. I don't have a job. I'm mm -hmm. gonna experiment. You know, uh, but when I'm working on a, a show or a film, whether it's Warrior or anything else, there's a very specific goal that I have to achieve. And the vision and the goal is not set by me. It's set by either a director or a showrunner. So you have to kind of take someone else's vision, understand what they want, and then still keep it as an expressive art form for yourself and, you know, do, do the best that you can to still be an artist, still be creative, still do something fresh and authentic, and yet still achieve a goal that has been set for you by somebody else, mm -hmm. you know? Yes, definitely. I'm working on my first non-student short film now, and I have definitely seen that side. It's, for me at least, I see it very similarly to you when, as opposed to when I'm writing music for an ensemble or just for myself. It's different when it's not the objective or thought process of your own self. It's, I have to interpret somebody else's creative vision. Uh, one of my uh, favorite composers, he described it as kind of being the musical therapist for the film or video game or, or whatever. It, 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 that's a very good way of looking at it. <laughs> so this is a more technical question. 
what is your process for working with a co-composer? It's not something you see a lot where you're working with another composer. Do you guys divvy up the cues or do you guys like work together to build each one up? What is that like? Um, yeah, so with Warrior, I scored it with Scott Salinas and um, we, we kind of had a, a mix of the two, you know, um, what we would do is we would get together and have a physical meeting in the days before COVID. <laughs> And, um, and at that meeting, we would do two things. We would establish which of the cues we're going to work on together and then which one we would take home individually as homework. And the ones that we would work on together, we would then just spend the rest of the day in the studio writing stuff together. Um, and then, and that was probably one day a week. And then the rest of the week, we'd work on the homework, which was what we divvied up. Uh, but the divvied up stuff, a lot of it was related back to the stuff that we worked together. So even though we only wrote for one day a week together, we probably wrote like more than 50% of the themes in that one week. And then a lot of the divvying up has to do with, you know, reinterpreting some of those themes or, you know, presenting them in a different way in a different context or something, you know. Yeah. What is your favorite part of that collaborative process? It's really fun to, you know, to, ex to express your musical ideas and have instant feedback. And also for someone else to do that for you and you give them instant feedback and go back and forth and together. Um, it's, I find that the way that film composers work you know, it's not the way music really comes naturally when you're a kid, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, when you're young and you're learning how to play an instrument, you're not just always just sitting there playing your flute by yourself, you know what I mean? It's like you are playing in a band, you play guitar, you play with a keyboard player, with a drummer, you know, whatever, right? So music's always collaborative. And as, as I was saying before as well, like, really the root of music anyway from a anthropological point of view has this ritualistic aspect of communion with it you know community uh and so it's really nice to work with another composer because it brings all of that back to the fore as well you know that, now it's not just about me in a room with a computer it's about me and another human soul and we're like bouncing ideas off and we're vibing and, you know i honestly love collaborating with people it's personally my favorite part of being a composer is that experimentation and instant feedback part of making music it's kind of magic in my eyes it is magic especially when you're jamming sometimes you know like when you're just playing something and they're playing something and you know and especially when you're jamming and you have key changes or some dramatic thing where you both get this instinct, like we're going to go in this direction, but you didn't talk about it verbally. You just kind of like vibed with each other and the music just went there and it's like, wow, how did that happen? You know? Yeah. It's, oh, it's one of my favorite things. I was just at a jazz jam last night and it still just awes me. So my last question for you of the interview and related to Warrior, because I know you also think about these areas of philosophy and whatnot a lot. What are your thoughts on the writings of Bruce Lee, which are a large part of how the Warrior series has come to be? Oh, wow. Uh, Bruce Lee is, um, I think Bruce Lee and Prince are like my biggest influences in life, even outside of music or fighting or the things that they're famous for you know um because both of them had this both of them had this idea of integration in their core you know uh you know like bruce lee was obviously very chinese and proud of his roots but he was also all about sharing his culture and his knowledge 
with the West and all about like, into, you know, about just, he wasn't about like being confined. He was proud of his culture, but he wasn't confined by it, you know, and he was, and he, he didn't need to make it something that divided him from other people. It, it was something that, you know, was a cause for celebration and bringing it together with people for people to share ideas. And Prince likewise, you know, a black artist who, you know, dominated white music for a very long time, you know, and, and I'm using those words, black and white, only because back then it was divided like that, you know, like in the 80s. It wasn't um, as, mon as much as problems that we have today, we are a lot further forward in, you know, in a lot of ways of thinking than we were like in the 80s, you know, and back then it was amazing for this artist to come and, and do what he did, you know, um, and mix up R&B with rock, with, you know, soul, with all, funk, with all the amazing things that he did. And if you ever went to a Prince concert and you looked at the audience, it was like a utopian idea of like, you know, what, what a perfect world might look like, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really feel like um, both of them had this spirituality, both of them had uh, connectivity with people, both of them had positivity, both of them had ideas about how to make the world a better place starting with their own actions, you know, so, and that's something that's always inspired me. I love that. I couldn't have said it better myself. I grew up doing martial arts. I was a competitive Taekwondo um, student for 12 years and Bruce Lee was one of my um, role models as I was doing that. I wanted to have the same approach to competition and how martial arts can grow you as a person as he did. And it's really cool to see how those kind of examples seen from Bruce Lee and Prince have affected your life and creativity as well. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Yeah, it is, it is a beautiful gift. It's a great discipline, you know, and I, now I do yoga. I used to also do a lot of martial arts, but as I've got older, I've kind of got calmed it down and gone more down the yoga path. But it's the same concept, you know, training your body and your mind together. It really just actually ultimately has an effect way beyond the physical, you know, which is a beautiful gift in one's life, I think. I agree. Well, thank you so much for joining me today and have a great rest of your day. I'm so excited for the rest of the world to get to see Yang and catch up on season three of Warrior. And I also look forward to hearing your music down this new road that you are approaching. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a great interview. Thank you. Thank you. Have an awesome day. Bye. You too. Bye. Hi guys, thank you so much for tuning in today to this episode of Chatting with Creators with Renza Safina. I loved talking to him about his process for composing, his thoughts about religion and nirvana and Western culture, and most of all about his creative process. I hope you guys like this episode too. Please let me know by liking, sharing, subscribing, doing all the things to help the show get out there. If you want to find out more about the series, please be sure to check that link tree link down below in the towel section of wherever you're watching or listening so that you can find out more and listen to more of the series. Thanks all. I'll have a new episode up for you next week. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.